Kyle already mentioned that Vacation Bible School is coming. We are excited for Vacation Bible School. We're excited for all the kids that are going to be here. And to you high schoolers who have seen the flyer that says for junior hires, and you're thinking, I do not want to be around a bunch of junior hires. First, let me say the majority of the kids that are going to be there are high schoolers. Second, everything that is geared for high school. This will be a fun and encouraging and exciting thing that you will not want to miss. Second, well, I'm, I'm way past second. Multiple, if you are part of the Vacation Bible School or you're involved with the junior high or high school event starting on Monday, we have a meeting tonight at 6 p.m. If you can be there, please do so. I think we have plenty of cookies. We are short on Monopoly board. Why do we need Monopoly boards? Well, if you're interested, come and show up. We have a live Monopoly game that we'll be playing, which should be, should be a lot of fun. We're, very, we're looking forward to that. It will be a very exciting time. Thank you so much for your generosity. So many of you are opening your house for our little missionaries from Reading to come down and take showers so they will smell clean and not native. That's a good thing. So please continue to pray for the kids who are coming here. Pray for their salvation. For those kids who already know the Lord, pray that God's word would encourage them and strengthen them and help build that strong foundation that so many parents have already, already laid in their lives. We met with our mission committee on Wednesday, I believe, and they had some money that was set aside, and they decided to send $600 to help what's taking the Sittners in Mali. There's some catastrophes and things that are taking place, and we thought it would be good to allow you to participate in that, to bring that problem to you with the widespread of famine, civil war, lack of water. The area is in a catastrophe. Believers from the north are headed south. There are really no jobs in the south. There's really not food in the south, but they're moving because of persecution and, and lack of anything being there. So if you'd like to give towards that and help Advent, I have some information here. You could stop by the church office and they will make sure any money that you designate to that will go there. I'd just like to thank the church body for their love, for their concern. I appreciate this group of people who stand together united. Regardless of the circumstances that take place, they are united in Christ. We sing together. We praise the Lord together. We come together in prayer because we desire to bring glory to the Lord. In all things that we do, and we minister side by side, serving one another, serving strangers side by side. Because we recognize it's not about us. It's not even about our own comfort. It's about Jesus Christ. And we want to honor and glorify Him in what we say and what we do. The days that we live in surely cannot be long. It cannot be much longer before the Lord returns or we go to visit Him ourselves. And that with the time that we have left, we want to do everything that we can to bring honor to him. So I wanted to say thank you because I see that reflected in this body of believers. And it is to his glory. Let's open a word of prayer. Then, my Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you that we are united under your word because it is your word that moves us and motivates us. We are different as the day is long. But those differences are set aside because we want to be conformed to your image. We want you to work in us to remove things that shouldn't be there and to put in things that should be. We want to be known as men and women to where if we are hit, we reply as Christ would. If we are cut, we bleed your word. And if we are pressed down, we rise up and sing your praises. Father, we ask today that our hearts and minds would be focused upon your word. Help us to see your message and how that it would encourage us and strengthen us 
and realize that your word is motivated and used by you in other people's lives. We pray for these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Take out your sermon notes. Grab a pen. If you don't have one, you can come up here and get one from me. (laughs) It's 6 p.m. and everyone is gathered at the table. The scrumptious smell is drifting throughout the house. At each moment, new flavors are coming to your nose. Your mouth begins to water in anticipation, and you scan the table, and with your eyes, you notice that the butter is melting into the kernel of corn. You see steam rising up from the fresh baked bread, and the gravy is flowing freely and generously all over the mashed potatoes. The steak is brought in, and you can still hear it sizzling. This is a thing of beauty. Suddenly, as if someone had grabbed the edge of the tablecloth and pulled all the dishes onto the floor, you hear, I don't like that. Do I have to eat it? The peace and serenity are about to give way to discouragement and frustration. It may surprise you to learn that the Apostle Peter was a picky eater. In Acts chapter 10, the Lord lays out a wonderful meal for Peter. And he's told to eat from a wide selection of food provided. But being a law-abiding Jew, Peter would not eat from an unclean animal. Therefore, he rejects the food offered. It happens three times before the food is removed to heaven. Peter was not only picky about his food, he was picky about the people he associated with. He was picky about who he was willing to share the gospel with. And Peter's pickiness was about to be reclassified. Have you ever been picky about sharing the gospel with someone else? Automatically writing them off as not worthy or too sinful? People who, may, people who are different from you and I, who may reject you, laugh at you, or scorn you? And yet the gospel is not about you. It's not about us. The gospel is about Jesus Christ. The message of Acts tells us how the gospel changed people. It changed their life. It changed their attitude. It changed their focus. And the author of Acts, Luke, records for us this message that is found in chapters 1-8 chapter 1, verse 8, and we see how this message is spread throughout the world. Jesus tells the disciples, I want you to be a witness of me in Jerusalem and then into all of Judah and Samaria, finally into the ends of the world. And it's so nice that the book of Acts splits into a nice section. Chapters 1 through 7, we see the main focus is in Jerusalem and the witness that's taking place there. In chapters 8 through 12, the message has gone out into Judea and Samaria and the witness is going there. And in chapters 13 through 28, the message has gone out to all the world. And people are hearing about Jesus Christ and how he has changed their lives. The message is a simple message, yet life-altering. Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the grave. If you believe in him, you can have your sins forgiven. You can have eternal life. What a message. Simple, short, life-changing. As we observe in Acts chapter 10, 
turn with your, in your Bible with me to Acts chapter 10. We see how God uses individuals in preparation for the message, in the presentation of the message, in the proclamation of the message, and finally, the power of the message. The message was given to the apostles, and that message has been passed on to fellow believers. Those fellow believers have passed the message on to us. Now that message has become our message. And our message is to make sure it is presented. God has taken care of the preparation. We'll see the preparation of our message, and we'll see the proclamation of our message, and we will see the power of our message. First, let's look at the preparation of our message. Acts chapter 10, verse 1 through 22. For time constraints, we're not going to read through the entire thing. Mel has given us an introduction as we read through this. But there are two men that God prepares. Each man is from a different background. Each man represents a large group of people. Cornelius was a centurion, a Gentile. A people group who did not know God and they had no relationship with him. But Peter, Peter was a Jew. A people who did know God, who had a relationship with him. More importantly, Peter was a Christian. He had a special relationship with Jesus Christ. He was saved. And in preparation of our message, God prepares the unsaved and the saved alike. Notice how God prepares the unsaved in our passage. When Mel read the first eight verses, God sent a vision of an angel to Cornelius, directing him to find Peter, who had a message from God. The moving of God is mysterious to us. How God prepares an individual is as varied as personalities in this room. Think of the Philippian jailer. He's prepared by the praying and singing of hymns to God by the prisoners. The Ethiopian eunuch, he is in his convertible chariot and he is prepared by the word of God. And then think of the thief on the cross. He is prepared by receiving the punishments for his crime. The unsaved are not the only ones who need to be prepared for the message. God prepares the saved also. In verses 9 through 22, the Spirit of God speaks to Peter in verse 19 and 20. Look there with me, please. And while Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing. God must prepare the heart of the saved to witness to the unsaved. It's, there's a natural resistance within us that can creep in after the euphoria of salvation is over. Where we hesitate, where fear comes in, and we say, I don't want to share the gospel with that person. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do. The excitement has gone away. The reality of the Christian life sets in that the Christian life is hard and difficult and relies daily upon a risen Savior. But we look back in history and there were men that, of saved persuasion that God prepared. Roger Williams started Rhode Island. Against his peers, he started to go out and preach to the Indians. Fellow Christians were not happy about that, but Roger Williams was concerned about their souls. God prepared Abraham Binginger. That name probably doesn't sound familiar to you, but it will when you get to heaven. Abraham Binginger was a Swiss boy from Zurich. He came with his parents to this country on the same ship that, jo that brought John Wesley. Father and mother of the lad both died on the voyage and were buried at sea. He stepped out alone on the gangway. 
onto a strange continent. There were not a single familiar face there to him. Where he had grown into manhood, he asked to be sent to tell the story of the cross to the blacks who were on St. Thomas Island, having heard of their great misery and degradation. When he arrived on the island, he learned that it was against the law for any person but a slave to preach to fellow slaves. It was the policy of the planters to keep blacks ignorant and superstition throughout the plantation. Shortly after the governor of St. Thomas received a letter signed by Abraham in which he begged urgently to become a slave for the rest of his life, promising to serve as a slave faithfully, provided that on his spare time he could preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to his fellow slaves. The governor sent this letter to the king of Denmark, who was so touched by it, he sent an edict empowering Abraham to tell the story of the Messiah when and where he chose, black, white, bond, or free. Let me bring this into the 21st century and a little bit closer to home. What about the Muslim people? People from the Middle East. Are they our enemies to fight or individuals to engage? Fifty yards down the street, we have a Muslim place of worship. When God preparation is complete let us focus our observation on those who are present the presentation our second point the, the presentation of our message as we read through this passage one might miss who is gathered at this presentation in verses 23 through 33 I don't want to spend the time reading through this I'll let you read later but I want to focus on these three verses 24 Follow along. And the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, and he had called together his relatives and close friends. Verse 29. Therefore I came without objection. As soon as I was sent for, I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? The I there being Peter. Verse 33. So I sent to you immediately, that's Cornelius, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Those who God prepares, he makes sure that they are present to hear his word. Cornelius had gathered the people together with an expectation to hear God's word. There was a pastor, this is a few years back, when television was becoming economically viable for everybody to have in their home. And he said, I've been thinking about a message that I want to bring to the people. And he says, I want to talk to you about the importance of TV. And the people were like, yes, I've been thinking about, do we want to have a television in our home? This was a big deal back then. For many of us are thinking, I have a TV in my... I, we, every room has a television. But there was a time in America where televisions were not in every room of the house. And so he told the people, in a few weeks I'm going to have a message on, on TV. The following Sunday came, and he said, I've been working on more, this more and more, and I think it's imperative that we look from God's Word to discover what God has to say about TV. The next Sunday, all the chairs were filled. People were lined up the back. He welcomed everybody in the church. Thank you for coming. He prayed, and he said, it is important for every person here to have TV. Total victory in Christ. That was an important message for everybody to hear. But people wanted to hear what God's Word had to say 
about having a television in their home. And some people got up and walked out the door. Cornelius and his group were expecting to hear a message from God. The attraction is just as powerful today. People are thirsty for God's word. The Bible is filled with epic themes of love and deception, dreams and hope, beauty and ugliness, feuds and marriage, power and corruption, civil war and hope, life and death. Who doesn't want to come and find out what God's word has to say about these things? If you want the answers of what's truth, you come to the word of God. People need answers, and the Word of God has the answers. Come. Have you heard about the man who tried to build a building so big that he wanted to reach God? Or have you heard the story about the man who could kill thousands of people, and yet he couldn't conquer his own passion? Have you heard that story? It's a fabulous story. And the real, the, the real kicker of the whole thing is that all these stories are true. They're not fables. The people are present to hear the message. People will come to hear our message because our message is God's word. Thirdly, we look at the proclamation of our message. In verse 34 through 43. There is no specific way to proclaim the gospel, but we can learn from others. As we observe Peter's method, I want you to notice four selections or four sections here. In verse 34 and 35, notice as we read here, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever hears him and works righteousness, 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 uh, I can't say the word, righteousness, he is accepted by him. In verse 34 and 35, Peter uses what he has learned, what he has learned currently in sharing the gospel. He's taken the dream that he had about the food. And he comes up with the idea, and he goes, okay, I get it. God is asking me to eat all this food that are, is illegal for me to eat to show me that there is nothing common that God has placed before me. When God brings a Gentile before me, there is nothing in common about that. These are people that God wants to bring into his family. And I should not exclude them. Secondly, he used historical facts. Verses 36 through 39. Peter goes through and gives a historical account. He says, The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word which you know, which was proclaimed throughout Judea, and began from Galilee after, baptized, after, ba after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, who they killed by hanging on a tree. Peter uses his own history and the historical facts in order to share the word of God. Friends, we know these things are true. These are factual. He uses current issues that are taking place in his life, in his method to share, to proclaim the good news. Thirdly, he states the gospel, 39 through 41. These are the mechanics, if you will. And we are witnesses of all things that he did. In Jerusalem, or excuse me, in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, who they killed by hanging on the tree. Jesus died. Verse 40, And God raised him up on the third day and showed him openly. He died and he rose again from the dead. 
And not, all, not to all the people, but to the witnesses chosen before God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. He arose and he wasn't just a hallucination. He wasn't a specter. He was a real live person who had a real life body. He ate food with us. We saw him. We touched him. Fourthly, he preached the gospel in 42 and 43. One of the key important things when we're talking about preaching the gospel is you need to ask the person a simple thing. I've told you the facts. Do you believe it? What are you going to do with it? Peter says, And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who obtained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the people witnessed that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins. Keyword believe. Do you believe? Peter's method was taking the current event that's, that God is working in his life, using historical facts, sharing the mechanics of the gospel, and then turn around and asking somebody, do you believe? But what about our method? What are methods that you and I can use? How do we proclaim the message? There are numerous methods that you can use. Perhaps you've used the Romans Road. The Romans Road is a good method, a great tool to use. It uses specific verses out of the book of Romans. It starts like this from Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned in our hearts. We are born in sin. We are born under the power of sin's control. God's word says that we are sinners. Then it goes to Romans 6.23, the first half. There's a penalty for sin. The wages for sin is death. That penalty, you and I cannot pay. We face physical death, which is the result of sin. But there's a worse, worse death, spiritual death, being separated from God forever. The Bible teaches us there is a place called hell. And it's for people where people are tormented forever. It's a place where people who are spiritually dead will remain, who have rejected Jesus. In the last half of Romans 6.23, it says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation is a free gift from God to you. You can't earn it but you can receive it. It is like one who stands holding a present saying, here is the present that I offer. And he waits. And he waits with the present in his hand. And lo and behold, hopefully, a person arises from their seats of life and picks up the gift. Praise God that there's an ongoing present there in his hand. As you pick it up, there's still another one there for somebody else. You haven't grabbed the last one. It's for all. God's gift for you is eternal life in Christ. God demonstrated his own love for us, Romans 5, 8, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died. Jesus died on the cross. He paid the penalty for you and I. Because we couldn't pay that penalty. He bought our salvation. He bought us out of slavery. The slave market of sin. He did all this because he loved us. And he was willing to give himself for us. His love poured out through Christ on the cross. And gave us our only hope of salvation. It is God's love that directed our salvation. It is not religion or church membership. It is that God loves you. So how do you respond? Romans 10, 13 says, Whoever calls on the name will be saved. Call out to God in the name of Jesus. God will hear you. Talk to God and tell Him. Romans 
10, 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. For it is with the heart that man believes into salvation. Any man can do that. Any woman can do that. If God is prompting you right now to speak to Him, tell, them, tell Him that you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and that He rose from the dead. And then just thank Him. And you've passed from death to life. The Romans road is just another method. Perhaps you like to use a current method or make up your own method because it is your message how God is working in your life. And it is that testimony that interacts with people. I like using things that I've spent time in digging in God's deep well of His Word and saying, <clears throat> this is what I was reading God's Word today. It said such and such. You know, I find it amazing that God's Word always has a wonderful truth to encourage me in my life today. You know, God's Word has encouragement for you. Have you believed that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? A person might say, Huh? Well, the Bible says that Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. He died for me, and He died for you. He did because we're all sinners. And I'll quote a few verses and share my testimony. And then I'll typically say, would you like to know God too? It's another method. It's my method. The proclamation of our message the proclamation of the gospel does not have a specific program. And the trick to it is that the more you use it, the easier it becomes. Because you will have God's word constantly on the edge of your lips. Lastly, we see the power of the message. And this is thrilling because we realize that it's not you and I that, do, that has to do anything except say the message. It doesn't matter if it's flawless or if we stutter when we say it. When we look at these final verses in verse 44, Peter is preaching away like there's no tomorrow. He has a group of Gentiles sitting before him as his, as his audience. And before he's even finished preaching, Gentiles have already believed. Look at 44. While Peter was still preaching, still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. Let's see the reaction. And those of the circumcised who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnified God. They believed what Peter was saying. Before he ever asked anybody to raise their hand and said, anybody believe today? Or before he made an altar call or anything like that, God's word had already spoke to their heart. God authenticated his message by having the same thing happen with these Gentiles as happened at Pentecost. And they spoke with another language. But it's interesting to know, what language do you think that they spoke with, spoke in? Who was the audience that was there? Who identified this miraculous thing and said, Wow! God has brought the Gentiles into salvation too. They're probably speaking Hebrew. Because when it says those of the circumcision, those who were the Jews, heard it and marveled and were amazed. Peter's response is an open challenge to God's great and miraculous work for anybody to say, hey, do you doubt what's taking place? Should not any of these be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? The response is, no. They have believed. Then they should be baptized. 
God does the work in the preparation. God does the work in the presentation. We participate with God through the proclamation. God is the power of our message. Therefore, there are three good reasons why we should share the gospel. And we close with this. God deals in the heart. It's not our fancy speech. Second, there is no distinction between people in the church. Regardless of how many nationalities there are, there's no distinction. God deals with them. Third, it, this, by sharing the gospel, it increases people's desire to know more about God. Because we see at the very end of this, then they asked him to stay a few days. These Gentiles wanted to know more. They wanted to know more about God. And Peter had God's message. As we proclaim our message of a living Savior, we can rejoice when it comes to the simple fact of surrendering all that we have to Jesus. We can freely give the reins of life over to Him, knowing that He will do the work. He will bring the increase. And as we look forward to this week, we can trust He is going to do everything. We are just participating and enjoying and praising Him for what He's going to do. Amen? Let me follow. We thank you for our time together. We thank you that the message of, that was sent throughout the world is our message now. And what a privilege and responsibility we have to share with one, one another. It is not in our strength that that message goes out. But you do encourage us and require us to tell people about it. Lord, we're a little afraid sometimes. But you did not leave us alone. Even when it's one person, we're still a majority because we have your Holy Spirit living inside of us. Thank you so much, Lord, for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen.